Hello, welcome to Halcyon Top 5 Lists, where I count down my top 5 favourite things within a certain type of media or genre. On this episode, I'm going to count down my 5 favourite games of all time. But I must stress two points at this stage. Firstly, these are my top picks, and in no way a reflection of their technical or their sociological standing within the rest of everyone else's perception of them. And secondly, I'm right. So deal with that going in. Here we go, here are my top five favorite games of all time. This is one of the best games ever crafted, bar none. The game's story may be lacking in impact, and the game's final boss may be an overglorified dragon encounter throughout, similar to what throughout the rest of the game. But then again, this game has random dragon encounters. It's been designed to allow you total freedom over your story. Your character's progression, everything feels meaningful and rewarding. The combat is workable and dynamic enough to keep you entertained. There's a wealth to the lore and the mythos, and I'm willing to bet no two players' playthroughs have been the same. Every time I booted it up, I never quite knew what I was going to find, what kind of manner of monster or adventure or quest I'd be coming across. You are exactly what I was looking for. And to this day, I still boot it up occasionally just to get a sense of adventure, a sense of randomness when I venture out into the wilderness to see what the world has to offer me. However, poor load times, glitches, weird ragdoll effects, they still can't dent the wealth of worldwide content this game has to offer. With me personally logging around 200 hours worth of gameplay, more than the average noob, but certainly not enough to trouble some of the more hardcore players of this game. If nothing else, check out the soundtrack to this game. If this doesn't get your head at swimming with thoughts of adventure and riding off and battling, then nothing will. It's absolutely beautiful. It's an outstanding game and one where you're the centerpiece of the world and where everything centers around the choices that you make. And it's an absolute gem of a game. Coming in at number 4 is Mass Effect 2, and it gets the nod over 1 and 3 because of its superior combat over number 1, and the superior characters and concept when compared to the third instalment. The game redefined what I thought an epic story could be. It engaged me on an emotional level that no game before or since has. It allowed you control and guidance over one of the best stories I have ever played, and brought a new concept that, even with you being the hero, that you might not win. Maybe he won't win. Maybe he won't make that dash from the ship to the cliff that he's about to be hurling himself off of. Even carrying over options from the first instalment through to the second in terms of its dialogue choices and the story progression that you found yourself choosing from the first game, the game builds and builds and builds into a climax that's both satisfying, unpredictable and freaking amazing. The combat is much more improved and by no means a genre leader. However, when compared to other RPGs at the time, it gave a real sense of action to its play. While keeping some of the more tactical nuances of its first game, such as the use of directions, the use of biotics and specialist abilities, add to this a diverse cast of characters that are engrossing in their own right, and each have paths and agendas of their own that you can choose to support, sabotage, 
or even ignore entirely. And you have yourself a swashbuckling crew of badasses ready to fuck up whoever dares cross them. I won't be second guessed on my own ship by my own ship. Do it. Very well, Shepard. The controls are online. The switch and consequences are yours. Human. Male. Before you die, I need a name. That's acceptable. I'll fight for you. I'm glad you saw reason. Huh? Control of your own ship, a compelling narrative, excellent exploration through planet to planet, town to town, even within the confines of your own ship, great graphics, mind-blowing sound design, good gunplay, great characters and voice acting, and within the universe, your own crew, characters that you can bond with, even get jiggy with if you feel the need to. And a satisfying and gratifying finale that warrants another playthrough to see what you missed out from your initial choices. What more could you ever want in a game? Aside from in the next three. Coming in at number three is the original Fable, although on this occasion I did review the HD version or the Anniversary Edition. It's just such a charming game. It can't hope to compete against its next-gen counterparts, for sure, in terms of its graphics or slickness of gameplay. But it has bags and bags of character. It has such a rustic feel that resonates with me quite a lot, being a country boy, you know. That was a terrible accent. The game has one of the most delightful scores I've ever had the pleasure of listening to. A unique and cartoony cutscene style, and a world design that I really love. And best of all, a combat system that combines two things that I really love and never really thought would be possible within the confines of a game. It makes you feel powerful, but never godlike making the game feel easy. like Prototype, for instance, are an excellent example of making you feel all-powerful, but can suffer from a plateau of difficulty, making it quite easy to feel bored by the overall experience. It lacks challenge or urgency, allows you to bulldoze through everything. This game encourages experimentation with the flow of your combat, the way that you choose to approach battles with different enemy types presenting different problems, with the challenge not inherently being to take them out, but to improve your combat multiplier to as high a level as it can possibly go. Now, technically, it isn't as astute as the two previous entries on this list, that's for sure. But it does something that the other two games don't, and that's invoke a childlike sense of awe with some of the more simple things that it allows you to do. Giant monsters, the undead, pulling swords out of stones through sheer strength, have you heard the legend of this sword? A knight of the old kingdom called Hugh wielded a sword like no other. He is a giant. The sword cut through monsters, people and demons like parchment. It possessed power, power that mortals could not control. Dying, Hugh thrust it into the living rock from which it could never be removed. Legend says that only somebody as strong as Hugh the giant can remove it. Perhaps it's just an old wives' tale. Perhaps it's a fake. Hey! Go on, you can do it. Uh... Hey! <gasps> wow, you're as strong as a giant. Wait until the chief hears about this. Magical powers you can learn and improve upon, and a magical school for heroes to learn and train in that isn't Harry Potter. It's a storybook in game form, and being a sucker for that kind of style, 
It's why it's a combination that I fell instantly in love with. A great combat system that's gratifying and satisfying in its own right, irrespective of what point you are at the story. And a presentation style that I think is really quaint in its own way. Therefore it earns its spot on this list. And with the HD version having now been released, it looks even better than ever, even if it doesn't play as smoothly as I would like at times. Nevertheless, Fable is just one of those games that I know I'll be playing even when I'm 85. Coming in at number two is the Knights of the Old Republic. This was maybe the first game I ever played that had one of those moments that hit me right where I lived. One of those jaw-dropping, mind-shattering, life-altering moments in gaming that still is pretty sweet when you think about it. The Knights of the Old Republic gave me the opportunity to do something I'd always wanted to do in a Star Wars game, but was never given the chance to do. Become a Jedi! In the sense that there was a real narrative behind your character at first, a reason behind joining the Order, and having a purpose to honing and mastering your crafts within the Force. And better still, within the confines of having a character that I could mould and make my own. During my first playthrough, I did the normal thing. I adhered to the ways of the light, reaping the benefits of the adulation of the people that I had saved and stood up for in the name of justice and battling the tyranny of the dark side of false. Then, on my second playthrough, I pretty much straight up murdered anyone that had the barefaced audacity to cross my path, contradict me, talk to me, offer to help me, and generally came into contact en route to reclaiming my mantle as the Dark Lord of the Sith. Spoiler alert, it's been nearly 15 years, you must have played this game by now, and if you don't... You're Revan! Darth Malak. <laughs> I hope you weren't thinking of leaving so soon, Bastila. I've spent far too much energy hunting down you and your companions to let you get away from me now. Besides, I had to see for myself if it was true. Even now, I can hardly believe my eyes. Tell me, why did the Jedi spare you? Is it vengeance you seek at this reunion? The game's design is thoughtful, authentic to the Star Wars universe, simple in places while complex in others, but all lends itself into an epic, dramatic, humorous, and frankly excellent addition to any gamer's collection, fans of Star Wars or not. And while the second game did have more in ways of combat, more depth to its gameplay, slightly improved graphics and better exploration, the unpolished and un unfinished nature of the thing always stuck with me and stuck in my gore while I was playing it. I always felt like I was playing a darkened version of something that was never really finished and had no love placed into it. Plus, as I've just mentioned, it was an inherently darker game, but it's light side or dark side that you tried to play through. I don't regret playing the second one. It lets me meet one of my all-time best friends and someone I would consider to be a brother. But this game is the daddy of the series though. Great feeling combat when it's appreciated properly, excellent dialogue options that always translate well from what you've selected to the screen, great depth to its RPG elements, a great story filled with wonder and intrigue for even the most hardcore fans of the Star Wars series. Especially smart marks like me who thought they knew it all. And that twist makes this one of the best games ever and somehow not to get a HD remake. Bioware, LucasArts, if you're still out there, or EA or Disney, please, come on now. And number one... Pokemon Green, Blue, or Yellow, or Red. I know. What? 
have all of those games, no sports games, no first person shooters, driving games, fighting games, or whatever, but put a, a Game Boy game from the 90s in at number one. And not even one type, not even one colour, essentially four games. And allow me to explain. Before hipsters decided that Pokemon was cool again due to the release of Pokemon Go, I did have, and always will have, a fondness for this game series. And yes, they all count as one because Nintendo were the ones that decided that, hey, we need to sell four different types of a game. I know, let's take the 151 Pokemon, split them up so that you can't collect all of them in just one game, so you'd have to buy them, or you'd have to trade with your friends, meaning you'd have to buy accessories to allow you the pleasure of doing so. Otherwise, you can't max out the game 100%. To be honest, that's one of the things that made the game great. It made it addictive as f You're always on the lookout for more. Always on the lookout for more Pokemon. Stronger Pokemon. Better training methods. Better items. You were eager to battle other people. To see what they collected. To see what they trained. It's embedded in the very fabric of the franchise. You have to collect them all to be the best. So why does it make it at number one spot over something that's more technically superior, or something with better story. Simple. It's the first game I ever really mastered. That's right. All 151 Pokemon, all to level 100, all 8 gym badges, all the Elite Four, and a smug son of a bitch rival who thought that picking an Eevee was somehow going to beat me. And all of that was just the start. Because you see, while others were chasing the Missingo cheat, and using that to multiply various items by 100 or 1000 or however the case may be, and then utilising the particular cheat of the rare candy to max out their Pokemon as quickly as possible, I opted instead to go for a slightly different tact. I trained my Pokemon naturally. Why? Because I loved doing it. However, this had an unintentional and rather magnificent side effect. Naturally trained Pokemon from lower levels are more powerful than those who have been roided up by the, uh, the special candy tree. So when the time came for a game to be played with me and my friends, it was a massacre. Ah, oh, it was magnificent. Not since Tekken 3 when I rocked up to my friend's house who were having a game party for whatever reason, having been stuck on the true, lo uh, true ogre level on Tekken 3 for probably the better part of an hour, an hour and a half, I sat down on the max level with I can't remember who and beat them in one shot. And never before had I felt such mastery over a game. And in essence, that's what all gamers are seeking in some small way of fashion. Entertainment through the attainment of goals. Overcoming obstacles. And establishing dominance within a virtual world. Add to this the nature of Pokemon. They're the cutest little bastard things. And the thrill of a tight battle, excitement of catching a new Pokemon, the pride of a Pokemon leveling up, and that moment of utter awe seeing a Pokemon that you've trained evolve into a more powerful version of itself, and becomes even more of an ass kicking machine is a feeling that, to be honest, is unparalleled and on tap within these Pokemon games. It has great replayability can be played in little 10 minute bursts or 12 hour monster sessions as was the case back in the day I didn't have a girlfriend or friends hadn't quite discovered MSN yet either so had to fill the time somehow it has a decent story but timeless design especially when considering the sprites and the world of which you inhabit in this game and a really catchy soundtrack that when packaged together created a buzz in my youth that no game before or since has even come close to. The original Pokemon games, be it red, blue, yellow or green, are quite simply my favourite game of all time. And that was the top 5 games of all time list. Really appreciate you checking it out. Please leave your list in the comments section, and the most mentioned may even make their way into a proper review one day, especially if the game is pretty sweet and I haven't thought to cover it. In the meantime, please like, share and subscribe. And stay tuned for the next episode of Top 5's hitting next Wednesday. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and take care.